All right. Well, I want to begin just with two readings that kind of shoehorn us into our catechetical study today. One is a familiar passage of Genesis 1, which talks about man being in God's image. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the, of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So notice how God gave man responsibilities under the privilege of being in his image. But now I move to Titus 3. Right, Titus 3, 3 through 7. That's what I want to make sure I do. Yes. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, and by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There's a lot in that little package, but it talks about how God moved us from a life in nature to life under grace, and then to a life with hope in the glory to come. Um, that's what's in store for image bearers who are remade in the image of Christ. Now, in light of that, I chose the catechetical study on free will. How exciting a topic that could be the day. I mean, that's all we debate about in our society right now, is what is freedom and who gets to use it? Free speech. Who gets to apply it? Who gets canceled by it? So it's, it's always been a battle in terms of how man looks at liberty and how, it, how he practices the role of the freedoms that he's been given. Christians, particularly, who are made free in the Son, particularly should be interested in this. Um, because to be free in Jesus Christ is to be free indeed, as our Lord said. So I'm looking at the Westminster Confession of Faith, one that I often look at, but is very harmonious with certainly the Dutch traditions of confessions. Um, and it's chapter 9. And it's only five sections. And I will move through this rather readily. Um, but I want us to get a sense of the harmony of the confessions, but also that they deal with this topic. And I'll explain why that's important to think about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for truth, the spirit of truth. Jesus is the truth. Thank you, Lord, for revealing that to us through your holy word written. May your voice speak to us through your word. And may it shape and frame and direct our hearts accordingly with joy in the Lord and in his strength. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to 
begin by reading what the Westminster Confession of Faith has to do about God's eternal decree. Now, that's always an area of Christian growth to come to terms with what does that mean for my life, that God is in control of everything. But it says, I want to recall a phrase that comes through that at God's eternal decree. It says, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet, so thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. That's kind of a qualifier, um, given probably the debates going on that they wanted to deal with. But I want to take that idea, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away. Later on in the confession, they deal with that under of free will. And, but that's important when we think of liberty to begin with. Liberty is not license to do as you please. Liberty has a framework by which we are responsible to act and to express our conscience on what we value and desire. See, the statement, but that statement in the decree establishes that free will is under God's sovereignty. Now, that's important because man's liberty requires authority. You can't separate the two. Before mankind exists, the Bible says, in the beginning, God. When it says, in the beginning, God, that means it establishes all other beginnings are under his sovereignty. It shapes all existence, all meaning. It sets the primacy, the centrality, and the authority for all human life, including human freedom. When God says, I am who I am, and I will be who I will be, he means his freedom must be central to how we interpret our freedom. It's a delegated freedom that he gives to us. Even in a verse like Matthew 17, 12, where it says of the people that says they were doing whatever they pleased, they still do so within God's rule, purpose, and plan. They can't escape it even if they deny it. So that's important that liberty demands authority. Now, in the growth of Reformed confessions and catechisms, from the Dutch tradition through the Westminster Standards under the Reformation and post-Reformation under the Puritans, God's supremacy over man, life, his activity, is a freedom. It's assumed. But over time, it had to be clarified, given the kind of debates going on within, against, well, that the Reformed Church had to deal with in terms of the Catholics, the Arminians, the Pelagians, that were constantly um, trying to denigrate a position, and they had to come to terms to clarify exactly what is meant by free will that does not do violence to God's sovereignty and his plan. The Catholics wanted the mind to be yet be naturally free, or the will was much more lenient under the Arminians and Pelagians, that they thought man by his nature had capacities to respond to God on his own. But the Reformed Confession says, no, that's not biblical in the fullest sense. So you have the Belgic Confession, it's 1561, it'll, it'll speak under the image as fallen and r ruined, but it'll speak of a few remnants that still flicker in man's fallenness. The Heidelberg Catechism doesn't quite address that, but when we go to the Canons of Dort, 1619, the same language of fall and image ruined, it speaks of glimmerings of natural light still flicker in man, vestiges. So man is not completely wiped out with sin, he's still man, he still bears the image, even though that image is practically annihilated. 
But yet there's flickerings, the fact that shows that he's that his humanity. So the Westminster comes along in 1647 and 48, and they said, we need to clarify this further. What this means is flickerings, these vestiges, these remnants that still exist where man is still man, but he's a fallen creature. And so, because he still makes choices. You and I make choices. Your neighbors, Christian or not, they make choices. And what do we mean by free choice? Well, one way is the capacity to exercise your will without interference or restraint as a genuine expression of who you are. Or here's a more concise one. A free choice is the absence of coercion. Now, we make countless choices every day. Even this morning before church, you make countless choices. You have many more to make after today. In today. We make choices that lead to actions, they lead to experiences, and they lead to consequences. So they're real choices. Decision-making is how we learn. It's how we gain experience and wisdom and grow in life and faith. Making decisions that are responsible help build your identity. Helping your children to make wise decisions will build their character. I like this author, Brian Herbert, who's the author of Dune, but um, he says something of this is interesting. He says, our capacity to learn is a gift. Our ability to learn is a skill. Our willingness to learn is a choice. Now we're going to investigate what is that choice, that willingness, because choice and will are very much connected. So let's look further in that, because we are volitional beings. We act according to our wills, under providence. But the spiritual condition of the heart will condition how free that will is to decide. So let's look. Now, in the Reformed tradition, it's significant, again, that they, there's a, a section on free will and f- or free agency in a Calvinistic kind of system. I mean, it aims to be comprehensive in that section on human freedom. Now, that shocks a lot of people. (laughs) What? A Calvinistic system with free choice? How could that be? There's a common notion in our free-loving society and in many theological circles that a theology built on sovereignty and predestination has no room for freedom. No space to claim any kind of free agency. I don't know if you've come across people who have assumed that, but that's one of their arguments immediately. Yet the divines created five sections affirming free will and not denying it. Why? Because God, it says in the first section, God has endued or gifted the will of man with a natural liberty. When God gives a gift, it's real, it's precious, it's meant to operate with value, purpose, and responsibility. But when he gives it, it's connected to other important things. Our free will is not some autonomous thing, autonomous decision-making capacity where we just do as we please and we're not connected to other things. No, what... In the Reformed thinking, free will is connected to your actions, it's connected to your responsibility, and it's connected to your ability. Actions that we possess, our ideas lead to actions. We choose those ideas. It brings real consequences to life. Responsibilities, we live in a moral framework of good and evil ought and ought not. We just can't will and not be held accountable for our moral choices. So we're not just living on our own independently, 
creating our own sense of what we want to do. Be fruitful and multiply. That's a responsibility God has given man. We operate within that framework. You shall have no other gods before me. That is a responsible comp uh, implication of being in the image of God and using your liberty wisely. If a thing is done against our will, from the outside we're not willing agents of that act. We're not responsible, at least not directly. And justice has a lot to say to that. But let's look at this. Because what they do, the first section, they establish a foundation, the inalienable right, or the fact of liberty. The divines are establishing a foundational point on natural liberty because what they want to say is there's no such thing as a compelled will. If a will can be violated in some way, it's no longer your will. Reformed theologians, you know, they never talk about forced will. They never talk about God forcing his predestination upon you. They don't have that language. We're not coerced to do what we don't will to do. That's not, that's not Reformed thinking. We're not forced to do what we don't desire to do or we don't want to do it from the heart. No, that's, God doesn't operate that way. And so that's important to think about when we think of at least natural liberty. God has gifted the will of man with natural liberty. Adam and Eve had liberty as image bearers. They thought, they had feelings, they had volitions that led to actions. It's, if God in his greatness freely is a freely choosing God, it makes sense in a sense that those who bear his image have some form of delegated freedom that gives them the capacity to respond to him in faith and love. To respond in, in ways that we are meant to respond. It's wired into us. There's real will, there's real liberty with choices that give real experiences. So a natural liberty, in a sense, is a trait inalienable to human nature. It's part of our kind of human DNA that God has brought into us. It says it's neither forced or absolute necessity by determined to do good and evil. We're not puppets. There's positive features, but Westminster doesn't really lay that out. It just wants to make sure what we don't start thinking in that category. So God does not operate by coercion or force, where we are forced to do something against our will. I don't know if you know the name John Gerstner. He used to teach at Westminster. He was kind of a celebrated name back in his day, not too long ago. But he had this to say, God didn't give us a will in order to force the will. If God forced the will to act, he would break it. Destroy it so it's no longer a will. See, because it's a real part of who we are as ourself. We make choices. We need a will to make choices. Even if it's dangerous or we still have to make a choice. It's a natural liberty. So we can't really say, my boss made me do it, as if the boss take, took away your choice. You still have a choice, you just have to think about the consequences. But you still have a choice because you have a will to make that choice. Or we can't say society made us do it. That's very common today, you know, to kind of abstract kind of things. It's the society's fault, it's culture fault. Society canceled my will to do this. Really? Did society take away your will? No, it didn't. Is it suddenly removed? No. You have a choice to make, and you have the consequences to reflect upon, as Stephen did before he was stoned. He took the consequence of staying true to God. His will made that choice before he was stoned. In the Nuremberg trials, 
those who are in the docket being tried for their crimes against humanity in the Nazi regime, one of their defenses was, I'm not responsible because I was ordered to do it. They are responsible because they still had a choice. And the judge did not accept that. So that's important to think about because they had natural liberty. They still had a will. So let's look at this. You know, Joshua said, Choose this day whom you will serve, and as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose. Make a choice. God has given you a will. So let's look at... That's the introduction. They're laying a foundation about this. It's an alienable fact of human nature. Christian or non-Christian, there's a, a, everybody has an element of practicing that liberty, limited or otherwise. But now they go into the fourfold state. What about that will? What about the freedom in sin or in Christ? Well, that's what they lay out here. The divines are getting at this. They make a contrast between a free will and an enslaved will. That's important. What kind of liberty must we have to make choices pleasing to God? That's the real question. Do we have the ability to do righteousness in a way that pleases God? They're going to answer that for the four states of human will. Proverbs says, above all else, guard your heart because everything flows out of it. It is the wellspring of life, and that's what we're getting at. When you look at the capacity of liberty, you've got to look what is the state of the heart. And that will decide the ability of what choices you have in terms of spiritual life. So let's look at that. The first one, um, you know, it's not a biblical concept, free will per se, but it's a way to speak of our ability or lack of ability to respond to God. So the real issue is the condition of the heart, the spiritual condition of the heart, that we can respond to God. Jesus used the metaphor of a good tree or a bad tree that produces good fruit or bad fruit. Good fruit does not come from a bad heart, but good fruit comes from a converted heart. It's that kind of metaphor of what, what comes out because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's the condition of the heart? That will direct the ability of a will to please God. So that's the bedrock. You know, Adam and Eve, it starts out. They had the ability to obey God or not to obey a God. They had a sinless personality, they, but they were unconfirmed in their righteousness. It was still mutable. Their will was designed for the good, good and upright. They desired to please God. They, had, they were given liberty to do that. It was a created integrity that they had. A, they had a com, the ability to love God and obey him. But they didn't. They fell. They were tempted to choose otherwise, and the will, the choice changed. As the will fell, the heart got darkened. So their state of innocence, which is the first of the four, disappeared. They were no longer innocent before God. Therefore, their choices became restricted. They were in darkness in terms of whether they ever could please God. So this, the confession goes to the second stage, the state of sin. Man wholly lost all ability of will to do any spiritual good accompanying salvation altogether averse from that good, he's dead in sin. He's not able by his own strength to convert himself, and he's not even, even able to prepare himself for that. 
we didn't lose free will. They lost the ability of free will to please God. They lost the ability to seek and desire and do good in a way that honored the Lord. So natural state of man in sin, he is now hostile to God. He makes choices that are rebellious. He has choices that are sinful choices. He adorns himself. He loves the darkness. And it's only the desire he has to do that. He thinks he's a free agent. But he exercises choices according to his desire in his desire to please himself because his will is enslaved. Destitute of ability toward any spiritual good. Sin disqualified him to seek righteousness and pleasing to God. So their freedom, what kind of freedom do they have? It's a freedom of a slave to the flesh. That's what freedom they have. Self-centered, doing evil, unspiritual, dead to sin, confusing reality itself. They're not able to convert themselves or be converted. So what does Paul say to things like that? All have turned aside, no one seeks God, no not one. They naturally don't understand nor do they accept the things of the Spirit of God. So that's the state of sin. State of innocence, now the state of sin, but there's a kind of free agency that goes through that that is adjusted accordingly. They're free according to their fallen desires. I mean, I think of the transgender movement today where people want to twist reality in order to fulfill their desires and they think they're free to do it and their freedom ought to give them what they hope to gain. Never mind that they're made in the image of God who has given them their gender. So you see what happens when man starts to think he's free to do what he wants, but it's a freedom of enslavement. It's a defiled heart that wants to do what the creature just wants to do. And it operates with hostility to truth. Unwittingly, they live with deception under the power of the prince of the air. They start living out dark and selfish actions. They are in desperate need of a mediator, which leads to the next level. State of innocence, state of sin, and now we go to state of grace. The will will be restored to do good, but it will still be mixed. So the confession says, when God converts a sinner and translates him to the state of grace, he frees him from his natural bondage under sin and by his grace alone enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. Yet, so as that, by reasons of remaining corruption, he does not do it perfectly or only that which is good, but can also have the will to do evil. So the regenerated Christian, saved by grace through the gospel of Jesus Christ, he is, con he is a converted man, he is a converted woman. I had a pastor in Scotland named William Still. He's gone to glory now, but he came out of the Salvation Army and he was a firebrand in Aberdeen. Um, and I had a chance to meet him on a few occasions because I was a student and a lot of students went to his church. And I went to his home one time because he loved furniture and he wanted to show off his furniture and I wanted to see it. And he introduced, he came up to me and realized that I was sort of new and and we were talking, and I said how much I appreciate a lot of his messages and being here, and he looked at me and he says, you know, you profess Christ, but are you a converted man? Are you a converted man? That's 
what's important in terms of the state of grace. Because you have to be a converted man to practice free agency in a way that you choose to please God. To desire God as a new creation with a new heart. The spirit implanted with new potential um, is the new life of Christ. You will want, your desires will change to do what honors God and to fulfill his will. You love the light. No longer do you love the darkness, though you can be tempted by it. Your habits and priorities and tendencies and affections begin to change. Your directions by the Spirit are in play. You begin to redirect your life. The Spirit breaks the grip of bondage under sin. If the Son sets you free, you are free and dead. I love that hymn. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. He sets the prisoner free. So that's the state of grace. We have a new freedom, but we need to understand that we can be tempted. We can backslide. We can desire the good, but find ourselves in a situation where we do not do what we ought to do. Vestiges of the old nature linger. Old habits are hard to die. So the confession, or even the Heidelberg Catechism says, all free will is weakened by reason of the relics of the old Adam remaining in us. Even as a Christian, there'll be relics of the old Adam remaining in you, in your trajectory of sanctification. As you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, there's that remnant that continues to battle against it, a conflict of tendencies, a struggle, vulnerability in our choices and actions. We may backslide for a time. We deal with spiritual warfare. So Jesus says, pray always and don't lose heart. Now we can understand why. We are under construction. We are born again, but we don't always perfectly conform to his will. But under trials and temptations, we can still do something unwise. We can still do something selfish, even evil, in a, maybe a reduced way. I mean, sometimes people come up to me and says, you know, this worldly person acts better than some of these Christians I've met. Well, probably because they're under construction and they're under warfare, unlike this other person that's more, more principled on the outside. But that's important to understand that we don't glory in our free will. Because what do we have that we have not already received from the Lord? So, so that's the summary of the state of grace. Free will remains. It's a new ability to respond to the good news, to love God, to walk and please Him by sufficient grace. I was blind, but now I see. We understand there are also why the Bible gives exhortations against sin to people in the church, because the apostles know that you can stumble, you can stray. And so we, we have that tension within us. But we're back on track to please God according to his grace and his power within us. You've been set free to do that. What's the last state? There's the state of innocence, lost, state of sin, we live in a world of that state, state of grace, where God calls you out of that, dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his son. And now the fourth stage, the moral agency, the state of glory. The will is not mutable anymore. It's immutable. You will determine the good. You will always do the good. That you will always want to do the good. You are perfected to do the good. You are made complete to do the good. So it says, the will of man is made perfect and immutably free to do good alone in the state of glory only. This is the final glory of state. When Jesus, the Son of Man's kingdom has come, it is set up. 
you fully enjoy seeing the Lord, you see him face to face in the kingdom of God, you fully enjoy his presence, you are freely and constantly doing the will of God and loving at every moment. He who began a work in you will bring it to completion. This is the completion. In the day of Jesus Christ, it's the state of completion. So we read, when he appears, we shall be like him because we see him as he is. Revelation 22, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be upon their foreheads, and they will reign for him forever and ever. Wow, can't wait. But right now we are in the state of grace with anticipation in between the first and the second coming of Christ. But each state that I have described, there is free agency. Because that's part of who we are in God's image, even image that has been ruined by sin. There's still that choice-making dynamic that goes on. But only in Christ do we, will we make choices towards the light of Christ, the light of the world. So that's important when we think of free agency. Sovereignty and free agency are compatible. That's what this confession is showing. But you need to understand what free agency means. So next time you have a discussion with an Arminian or someone in, in the free church tradition or you know, well-meaning, loving people, they love Christ, I don't want to take that away at all. But when they get into that discussion, surprise them. <laughs> surprised them about free agency and said, yes, I know you have, you know, there's free agency. But there's a different kind of ability. Do you have ability in your agency? Only Christ can give you the ability through the Holy Spirit to choose Christ. You can't convert yourself with your natural ability. But you can be free to make choices according to your desires. Praise God, your desires will be changed under Christ to make choices that honor God. It's like a house with one side of a roof and another side of the roof. You don't want to just emphasize one side of the roof. Sovereignty. You want to add the other side of free agency, even though the final outcome is not seen in God's providence and mystery and grandeur. But you don't want to live with just half your house roof, where you don't understand our responsibilities of being an agent in his image. And so the, the divines, the reformers, wanted to bring that together to help bring unity to their broken and divided country, in this case, England. They wanted to bring unity to the church by explaining what's really going on when we talk about free will. They weren't very successful and we're not successful today. God, the Lord will work it out. He will bring it about. But it's important for us in our discussions about free choice today and who has it, who shouldn't have it, you know, what kind of speech we should have. Um, that's all important under God's sovereignty and responsibility on how we make choices about how to speak, how not to speak, how to act and how not to act. And he has given us a will by which to know that and the power of the Spirit, especially through prayer, by which to have the energy and commitment to do that. So I wanted just to bring that to you in terms of our confessional tradition wants to honor that particular element in terms of what makes humanity humanity. Its fullness is in Christ. Its beauty will be in Christ. So we, I leave it with that in terms of understanding that particular, um, that particular teaching in the confession that is harmonious with the Dutch confessions as well. 
So I want to conclude with that this morning. And somehow I've misplaced, there it is, okay? So let's, before we sing, let's just close in a word of prayer on this particular passage. Lord, thank you for your mercies. You have made us to bear your image, to reflect your image, to walk as image bearers. And how we make decisions is important in terms of how we reflect that image to those around us in the church and outside of the church in this world. Lord, I thank you for your grace and mercy that has helped us and drawn us to the light, that you are the light of the world, that your light overcomes the darkness, and that you are working in us to bring us to completion, to fulfill your promise of glory in our life, that you are given us a heart for Christ, not a heart of stone, but a heart turned to flesh, whereby in the softness and beauty of Jesus we desire to do his will. Lord, help us to walk and not grow weary, run and not faint, looking to you as our rock and our salvation. Help us to make wise decisions. Help us to be clear and mindful of our decisions. Help us to think of consequences. Help us to think of responsibilities and actions. Often before we do them, give us a reflection upon that, that we may do what is wise and good and true in the building up of the body of Christ. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for those who have labored to give us the truth and to spell it out in ways that we can understand. Help us to stand firm in these things that you've given us in Holy Scripture. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.